Thanks, Courtney. Um, I am going to start with an apology, which is that um, I have a terrible cough uh, and I'm hoping that the tea that I have with me will suffice. But if not, I hope you will forgive me for being rude if I have to pop a cough drop. Um, as Courtney said, I'm going to talk to you today about um, sort of laying a groundwork for what you need to know before you have that first meeting with your collaborating statistician. Um, and we're going to start today with um, a video that I, I start this, uh, I start with this video um, every time I give this talk, because um, by laying this groundwork, I'm hoping we can avoid this. Sort I have of a study and I need to know how many patients I need. I think I only need three patients. Okay. What kind of study is it? I'm doing a lab study. Can I just use three patients? That depends. What are you trying to show? We always use three patients. Okay, what are you trying to show? I'm trying to show that drug A and drug B are better than only drug A. How are you measuring if it is better? We are looking at apoptosis. Can we just use three patients? What kind of measure of apoptosis? Do you know how variable that measure is? We always use three patients. That is what we have published before. Three patients per group or in total? Yes. Okay, let's try something different. What type of measure are you using? And is this an in vitro study? An in vivo mouse study? It is an in vitro study of patient samples, and we are looking at measures of apoptosis after treatment with drug A and drug B versus drug A and control. And drug B alone. Oh, how many groups are you analyzing altogether then? My grant is due tomorrow. I just need to know if I can just use three patients per group. <laughs> okay, well, you probably should have come to me earlier for help with this. All I need you to do is tell me that three patients are okay. So, it is not that easy. Your marker for apoptosis may have a large amount of variability associated with it that could make it difficult to ascertain differences based only on three patients per group. It also depends on what kind of outcomes you are looking at. Are you looking at normalized changes in expression levels from baseline? Three patients may not be sufficient to detect differences in these expression levels between the different treatment groups. I do not understand. I'm saying that you may need more than three patients per group, but that I need more information to determine that. The serine protease granzyme B is made in cytotoxic lymphocytes, where it is inactive due to the low pH of the storage granules. <coughs> it is measured immediately upon delivery into target cell cytoplasms, where the pH is neutral. <coughs> this is followed by cleavage of PROCA space 3 by granzyme B in the target cell cytoplasm and the subsequent induction of apoptosis. All proteolytic events can be quantitated at the live single cell level by flow cytometry and imaged by confocal microscopy. I understand very little of what you just said. Maybe we should talk more about this. I just need to know if three patients are enough. My grant is due tomorrow. We will need to meet to better understand this before we can determine the appropriate sample size. I can put you on my grant for half of a percent FDE. You can design and analyze the data later. Do you really think that is enough to do the work? Well, it may be less if it is awarded and the budget is cut. <coughs> Please go away. Okay, so um, most of your collaborating statisticians, oh, how do I get back? Bring them. There we go. Um, most of your collaborating statisticians have had an experience similar to this. Okay, um, it's 8.33 and uh... I think we should get going. Um, so um, welcome everyone. Um, I am Rebecca Batensky. I'm the chair of the 
there we go, sorry. Um, so again, most of your collaborating statisticians have had an experience similar to this. My goal with this talk is to lay that foundation so that you don't have an experience like this. Um, so we'll start with some disclosures. Um, I do receive consultant fees related to editorial service for stroke, um, and my department receives some for DSMB service as well. But I'm not going to talk about anything related to any of that or um, any unlabeled use of commercial or investigational products. And I also want to give a disclaimer before we get into the meat of this talk, because I could spend um, hours and hours and hours talking to you all about different designs and how we come up with the sample size for them and how do you choose between them. Um, and I only have you for an hour today. So we are gearing this talk towards the design of a superiority trial. And what I mean by that is a two arm randomized study where you're really trying to show that one arm is better than the other with regard to some specified outcome and where the end result of that trial is really the p-value from a hypothesis test to evaluate superiority. As I'm sure you've heard from your small group discussions, there are many other trial designs where the objective of the trial might be something other than superiority. Um, you might be trying to show that uh, a new treatment is not inferior to an existing treatment or you might be trying to show that um, a, a potential therapy is actually futile and there's no need to study it further. Um, or you might be in a situation where the end game might be something other than a hypothesis test. You might be interested in estimating the precision associated with your outcome or selecting among candidate interventions or doses. And in those cases, some of the factors that we're going to talk about here may be more or less relevant, or they may be not relevant at all. Um, but I do need to tie the talk to, um, to something. And so uh, a, su a typical superiority design is, is what we're using. So why do we worry about power and sample size? As I'm sure you've heard in the small groups, there's a lot of um, thought put into how many subjects are needed. Can you really answer this question in whatever phase of research you're in? And from a sort of theoretical standpoint, we worry about power and sample size because we want to have some level of assurance that the trial has a reasonable probability of being conclusive. Um, that means that we can determine the exact sample size needed so that we're not expending any more resources that, than are necessary. And that means that resources can be allocated more efficiently um, to a broad range of questions that might be of interest. Now, this notion that we can find the exact sample size necessary to allocate resources efficiently has ethical implications um, that are incredibly important, but we don't necessarily think about when we're designing studies, um, especially in the small, like the early phase space. So if we size a study too large um, with more subjects than we need, then we're exposing people to potential risk when we could already know the answer to our question. And we're taking money away again from those other questions and, and potential participants and, and um, research resources and so forth. If we don't size the study large enough, then we have the potential for misleading conclusions, meaning that we may not actually be able to answer the question that we're trying to answer. And so again, we're needlessly exposing participants to risk because there, there's, no, there's not gonna be a gain um, to the scientific community at the end of the study in terms of an answer to that question. Really, um, I think from for probably from your perspective, why we worry about power and sample size is that there are many instances in the literature of situations in which um, a study was performed, there's some evidence of something happening, but not enough to be conclusive. And so the scientific community is left um, with an answer that's not really um, palatable. And the example that I'll give you um, is from this New England Journal article in 2015. It came across my desk while we were designing the pediatric ice cap trial that is um, about to launch in the SIREN network. And um, it was looking at children with cardiac arrest who required chest compressions for at least two minutes and re remained dependent on mechanical ventilation after return of circulation. And these patients were randomized to two, one of two arms 
both representing targeted temperature management for 120 hours, one representing therapeutic hypothermia and one representing therapeutic normothermia. And the primary outcome of this trial was survival with a good neurobehavioral outcome at 12 months. Uh, the trial was powered um, for a sample size of 276 patients, and it was determined that that was sufficient to detect an absolute effect size of about a 15 to 20% improvement in this primary outcome. So the trial was conducted and the results published again in this New England Journal article. And when they reported on the primary outcome, they found that the normothermia group showed a 12% good outcome rate and the hypothermia group showed a 20% good outcome rate. So an absolute 8% improvement in survival with this good outcome, which is only about half of what they were powered to detect. And so the p-value was 0.14. And the conclusion from the New England Journal article is correctly from a statistical standpoint that therapeutic hypothermia did not confer a significant benefit. But they had to say in their limitations, of course, that based on the observed confidence limits around this effect size, they couldn't rule out a potentially important benefit, despite the fact that the trial was not significant. And we've had discussions um, internally among the pediatric ice cap group um, and myself as a mom um, thinking through this, that if my child had an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, an 8% improvement um, in the possibility of a good good outcome sure seems like something I'd, I'd want to, to go after. Um, so again, this is an example. There are many more of situations in, in which the trial was sized in a certain way. The effect that was seen was not quite what was hoped for. And so we're left with this sort of um, unanswered question. So we're gonna talk through today a number of factors uh, in determining sample size. We're going to talk through the level of significance and what its role is in the sample size determination. We're going to talk through the power that you're targeting, of course. We're going to talk about the minimum scientifically important difference. We're going to talk about variability in the response and experimental design. And all of these play an important role in determining the sample size that one needs for a particular trial. I'm going to um, spend more time on the first four than on the last one because there are lots of experimental design options that one might consider and that may greatly impact what the, the resulting sample size turns out to be. But before we can get into that, we need to talk about the research question. And you all have been meeting in your small groups. I'm sure you're very comfortable stating your research question in terms that um, your clinical colleagues can understand. But before you meet with um, your collaborating statistician or biostatistician, you want to be able to state that question in the form of a testable hypothesis. And that includes often more information than people expect. It's important to come to the table with, with information on what the population is that you're studying, what the specific response variable is that you're looking at what you're comparing to. So are you comparing pre to post, treatment to control? And at what time point are you taking that measurement? Are you looking at it longitudinally and you want to evaluate the time course or are you evaluating it at a fixed point in time? All of this information um, when provided with sufficient detail um, tells the statistician which statistical methods might be appropriate and which designs might be relevant. And again, that, that will, will carry into the sample size discussion. So the key to stating statistical hypotheses is twofold. We imagine that there are two states of nature and we can describe these two states of nature with two hypotheses, okay? The alternative hypothesis is usually where I start. And I start there because um, it's easier for most folks to state the alternative. That's the statement that you want to conclude. When you are designing your study and you think about what that, that result publication is gonna look like, what do you hope the last sentence of the abstract says? Okay, typically it's the intervention effects outcome or something along those lines. 
So that would be your alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is just the converse of that. So if your alternative is that the intervention improves outcome, the null hypothesis is that the intervention doesn't do anything. And that's the statement that you hope to contradict with the data that you collect as a part of your trial. Now, these hypotheses have to be mutually exclusive. That means that either the null hypothesis is true or the alternative hypothesis is true. They can't both be true. And they have to be comprehensive. They have to together make up the only possibilities for the truth. There can't be any other explanation. So what we're talking about in statistics really is the classical approach to scientific decision making. Um, the logic is based on the concept of proof by contradiction, which I'm sure you all are familiar with. So we conceptualize nature as being in one state or the other. Either the null hypothesis is true or the alternative hypothesis is true. We collect data from the real world and we assess the likelihood of observing that data under the null hypothesis. If the data is very unlikely as a result of random chance, then we reject the null in favor of the alternative. So if we're forced to choose between a simple model that nothing is happening and real world data that clearly contradicts it, then we have to choose to trust the data, okay? If instead the data is within what we would expect as a result of random variation, then we have to go with the simpler model. Um, and so that leads us to four possible outcomes for the result of our statistical test, okay? So we talked about two hypotheses. They have to be comprehensive. So either the null is true or the alternative is true. And there are two possible outcomes for the statistical test. We either reject the null and conclude the alternative or we fail to reject the null. Notice we don't say we accept the null or we proved the null. We just say we failed to reject the null. Um, so the null hypothesis is the simpler explanation. There's only two possible decisions. So what we have here is a table of four possible outcomes, right? Of the four possible outcomes, two of them are correct decisions and two of them are mistakes that we would like to avoid. Correct decisions, let's start here. We reject the null hypothesis when in fact it's false, okay? This is a great decision. You conclude exactly what you hope to conclude. The null hypothesis is false. The data support the alternative beyond a reasonable doubt. You write it up you present at a conference, it's the basis for the rest of your research career, it's a wonderful thing. There's another correct decision, which is slightly less exciting, but it's still a correct decision. And that has us failing to reject a true null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is true, the intervention doesn't do anything, and we conclude that there's not enough evidence to reject the null, okay? It's not quite as exciting. We all know there's a publication bias in the literature, quote unquote negative trials, um, sometimes have a harder time getting published, but it's still a correct decision. So what we're gonna focus on really then um, are the two errors which we want to avoid. The first of which is the false positive. The situation in which the null hypothesis is true, the intervention doesn't work, but we reject the null hypothesis and claim that it does, okay? So we're saying a difference exists when there isn't one. And there are implications to that, especially in clinical research, which is that we are um, going to expose future patients to this intervention, saying that it improves outcome when in fact it does not. So we obviously want to keep the likelihood of that risk minimal. The second error, again, which we want to avoid is the situation in which the null hypothesis is false. The intervention actually does work, but we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so that's the false negative. Statistical hypothesis testing basically allows us to make conclusions 
based on quantifying the risk of error in these two situations. So when you're reading the literature, it's important when you're evaluating the information that's provided to you to consider the magnitude of these errors. So in situations where a statistically non-significant result is reported, you should consider the risk of a false negative, right? If it's high or if it's low, that might impact the amount of faith that you put in the conclusions that are drawn. Similarly, if a statistically significant result is reported, you should consider the risk of a false positive. Again, if it's high, you might say, well, that's, that's a spurious finding. I'm, I'm maybe not awfully convinced. And if it's low, you might feel differently. So again, keep this information in mind. So we'll start by talking about the level of significance. The interpretation of the level of significance um, is that for a specified alpha level, even when the null hypothesis is true, we're going to conclude the alternative alpha times 100% of the time. Okay, this value should be pre-specified in the trial design phase, and it really should be determined according to how often you're willing to accept a false positive. And I feel like we don't often think about this part. We, we sort of have ingrained from basic statistics and, and um, instructions on reviewing the literature that 0 .5, 0 0.05 is what we use. But 0 0.05 is not a magic number. It is not the only acceptable number. You really should think about what are the implications of a false positive in this particular situation that you're testing and consider then whether 0 0.05 is appropriate. So how does this play into um, our sample size determination? So what I'm showing you here is a graph that um, demonstrates what the distribution of the test statistic might look like under the null hypothesis. So let's say we're comparing two binomial proportions. Um, if there's no difference, if the null hypothesis is true, then we would expect the test statistics to have a distribution that is centered around zero, right? And it has some spread. Um, and the shaded region reflects the, your willingness to accept a false positive. So if we're looking at a one-sided alpha of 0 0.10, this shaded region defines um, a, a threshold beyond which the area under this curve is 0 0.10, okay? So if we were to find a test statistic out here in this tail, and we were using a one-sided alpha of 0 0.1, we would in fact say, this is not very consistent with the null hypothesis, and we would, we would find in favor of our alternative. So as you decrease that alpha level, you're decreasing that shaded region, you're moving the threshold for concluding in favor of the alternative to the right. And so you're effectively making it a little bit more difficult. Okay, and so again, here I've shown you what the three regions look like together. So there are spaces, as we all know, in which for one alpha level, you might declare a positive test result, and for another, you might not. And so again, it's important to think about which alpha level is really appropriate for your particular scenario. The power um, is how we go about comparing our willingness to make, or how we go about controlling our willingness to make a type two error or to come up with a false negative result. Again, the risk is our choice, okay? But, while we specifically set the alpha level, we don't typically think about setting the risk of making a type two error. We do it inadvertently by setting the target power. So the power is the probability that a statistical test will reject the null when the null is false, okay? And we define that as one minus beta. Again, beta would be sort of the equivalent of the alpha level for the type two error. And the interpretation is that for a given value under the alternative hypothesis, we're going to reject the null in favor of the alternative one minus beta times 100% of the time. Now I wanna point out a couple of things here. One is it's specific to a given value under the alternative hypothesis. So when you're saying how much power a particular trial has, you have to say for what value, 
under the alternative, okay? And it is related to the sample size. So let's look at an example. Um, the first example I'm gonna show is a phase two clinical trial in subjects with acute ICH. The intervention is intended to impact health-related quality of life, which we're considering to be assessed by the NeuroQual, and we're going to evaluate it as a continuous endpoint. So I'm gonna show you now for this example, if I hold, hold everything else the same, how the alpha level is gonna impact the power, okay? So along the x-axis, we have the total sample size. Along the y-axis, we have the power. And I mentioned that as you decrease the alpha level, you're making it a little harder to, to find in favor of the alternative. And you can see that here, right? So for 100 subjects, I have less than 50% power if I'm using alpha of 0.01, whereas I have 70% power if I'm using alpha of 0.05, and 80% power if I'm using um, alpha of 0.1. So this is, again, this is how it impacts the power. This is not to say that you should choose an alpha level to give you the power that you want. You should choose the alpha level based on the risk of making that false positive, and then use that to determine the sample size required for your target power. The next thing we're gonna talk about is the minimum scientifically important difference. And this is the smallest difference which would mandate in the absence of side effects or excessive cost, a change in scientific practice or understanding, okay? And this is important because again, I said a couple of slides ago that the power for your study is associated with a particular value under the alternative hypothesis. So this is what we're talking about, picking a minimum scientifically important difference and using that to power your study. Now there's a well-known rule of thumb that the larger the difference, the smaller the sample size is that's required to detect it. It's a little bit simplistic and I'll show you why in a minute, but the general idea is correct. So again, here we have along the x-axis total sample size, we have power along the y-axis and holding everything else constant. So holding the alpha level constant, holding the variability constant, you can see that um, if I'm trying to detect a mean difference of 0.25, um, that is a lot harder for me to detect than a mean difference of 0.67, right? So my power increases as my mean difference increases for a fixed sample size. <clears throat> now, I mentioned that this rule, the larger the difference, the smaller the sample size is a little bit simplistic. And that is because it ignores the contribution of variability. So in the case of um, a continuous estimate, we need in order to power the study, some idea as to what the variance or the standard deviation of our endpoint looks like. And that's gonna help tell us how, how that curve for the test statistic um, or for the point estimate is gonna look. In the binary case, um, what we really need in terms of the variability is an estimate of the control proportion. All right, and again, I'm showing you here for the scenario we've been talking about where we're comparing two means on the NeuroQual. If I hold everything else constant, hold the alpha level constant, hold the mean difference constant, as my standard deviation decreases, my power gets better, right? The more precision I have, the easier it's gonna be for me to declare a difference. So that's for the continuous outcome. Let's reshape it just a little um, so you can see what it looks like for the binary outcome. Because uh, in, in my experience, um, it, folks often come with a binary endpoint and it can be a little bit jarring to see how much that control proportion impacts the sample size. So again, we're still talking about this phase two clinical trial in subjects with acute ICH. Um, but now I'm saying the intervention is not going to impact health-related quality of life. So my continuous outcome has gone out the window, and now I'm thinking about its impact on functional independence, defined using a modified Rankine scale score of zero to two. And I'm going to assume the minimum clinically important difference in this arena is absolute 10% improvement. Um, that's pretty common in stroke literature, but again, folks can argue uh, in either direction, I think, in that case. <clears throat> 
So same setup for the graph, but what we have here now is a line for each, each value of the reference proportion. So if my control proportion is only 10%, 10% of my control group is expected to, to achieve functional independence. And I'm trying to detect a 10% improvement in that um, my power changes as a function of sample size, of course, but I can hit 80% power with about 400, somewhere between 400 and 500 patients. As my control proportion increases, um, it gets harder, my power decreases. And the worst case scenario is gonna wind up being these control proportions between about 0.4 and 0.6, okay? And that's because the binomial outcome has most variability around a proportion of 0.5. So you can see, and the difference can be pretty substantial, right? We're talking here, um, at about 600 patients, uh, I have somewhere 90% power if my control proportion is 10% and I drop down to 80% power um, if my control proportion is 20%. So you really want to have some good information as to what that control group is going to look like. Okay, so um, I'm going to give you an example now of how reframing how you think about your question um, can impact the sample size and what you're able to do with a given sample size. So we're still talking about this um, phase two trial in ICH patients. We're still talking about functional independence as an outcome. And if I want to design this as a superiority study, let's say I have 300 patients and I'm imagining that in your head, most of you are already gonna argue that 300 patients is kind of a lot for, for a phase two study. Um, but let's say I have about 300 patients. I wanna use a typical alpha because that's what I know everybody uses. And I think that 56% of my control group are gonna achieve functional independence. And I'm, arguing that the minimum clinically important difference is 12%. And I'm arguing that because I know that 300 patients is, I'm, I'm gonna have a power issue. So if I have 310 patients available to me under the, this scenario, I have 59% power to show that this particular intervention, whatever it happens to be, improves outcome. That's not great. 59% power is going to have a hard time getting through grant review. Um, but uh, so I, let me back up a minute and just take the opportunity here to point out that um, this example right here um, is why many people criticize the typical phase two trial design as an underpowered phase three. Because what we do in order to make the sample size work for a phase two is we come up with a really, really big effect size, or we make the alpha much, much bigger um, in order to get the power that we need for the sample size that we have. A better approach might be, or an alternative approach might be, so I don't give too much of my bias, um, to reframe how you think about your hypothesis. So instead of showing that you want to, um, instead of saying that you want to show that your intervention is better than the control, what if you say, well, in phase two, I'm looking for a signal of efficacy. And so really what I wanna do is figure out whether my signal is so low that I don't care about it anymore, that I can weed out that intervention for future study. And that's what the futility design was, was intended for. So you can see here, we've reframed, reframed the alternative hypothesis. So instead of trying to show that there is a difference, we're trying to show that that difference is less than the 12% absolute that we care about. This hypothesis is already one-sided, which helps a little bit. And the literature for futility suggests that you can use an increased alpha level because the implications of making a false positive in this scenario are different. A false positive under this alternative hypothesis is actually that you're gonna throw away an intervention that doesn't work. So you're not exposing anybody in the future that, to something that you know doesn't work. So we're, we're willing to accept that, that possibility a little more often. Same reference proportion, effectively the same effect size. We wanna be able to say if the two interventions are exactly the same, I wanna be able to throw, throw this one away. 
And with 310 subjects now under this scenario, I actually do have 80% power to declare my intervention is futile, okay? So there are ways to rethink this, the phase two space so that you're not in this scenario of being criticized for an underpowered phase three. Um, there are lots of methods for determining power and sample size. There are closed form solutions for many of the common straightforward designs. Um, in many cases for the less common or less straightforward designs, um, you may be looking at simulation. Um, simulation just means that we're asking the computer to generate for us um, what might happen in a trial and do it over and over and over again so we can track the performance of that trial. So I've simulated in this scenario the, the exact superiority design that we were talking about on the previous slide. So under a control proportion, even if the truth is 56%, right, every trial is not going to give me a 56% estimate. So there's some variation in that control proportion. The treatment proportion, if it's um, 56, 68%, again, we're not going to get exactly 68% each time. There's variability. And with each of those simulations, I calculate the risk difference, I calculate the p-value, and I keep track of whether or not I'm able to reject the hypothesis. And in this very simple scenario that I admittedly did very quickly, um, the power that we achieve by simulation is 57% um, for the superiority trial that I showed you on the previous slide, where the closed form solution was 59% for the power. So very similar. Okay, so before asking about sample size, you now know to be prepared to talk about the level of significance alpha, and you're gonna set that in advance. You know to talk about the target power. 80% is sort of a minimum in most cases. Um, some institutes prefer higher. You know to talk about the expected variability in response, um, hopefully based on relevant literature, and even better would be to have a range of plausible values from the literature so that you can stress test the, the sample size that you come up with. You know to have some thoughts about what the minimum scientifically important difference is. You want to know what the smallest difference is that's gonna change practice. Not everybody may agree on that. Um, and there are certainly situations in which if the sample size for that difference makes the trial not feasible, you may have to have some room for compromise. And now we're gonna talk about experimental design options. Um, sorry, so yes, so somebody asked, could we talk a bit about how simulations can be run or point us to resources? So um, I don't know if Will Moyer is on, but he would laugh at me when I say that simulations are not for the faint of heart. Um, so I, Will is very comfortable running them himself. I don't know a whole lot of, um, of clinicians who are. Um, I have done them myself in SAS and in R. There are some packages that will sort of guide you through the process, but it's very specific to what the design is that you're looking for. Um, and you have to have a lot of information in terms of the inputs um, into those, those packages. Um, I don't know if that really help, helps you with that question or not. Um, another question, would you consider futility equivalent to non-inferiority? So I do not consider them equivalent. And the reason for that is because my threshold for declaring futility is likely to be much larger than my threshold for declaring non-inferiority, right? If I wanna show that my intervention is not inferior to the standard, I probably wanna show that it's like within one or 2% maybe. Um, Whereas when I'm talking about futility, I'm really trying to show that it's less than any minimum clinically important difference that I would power phase three for. Okay. All right, so some experimental design considerations. Sorry, hang on. Um, that one can think about. Um, and I'm, again, these are some of them. There may be many, many others that you've already talked about in your small groups. Uh, the first question you might ask is whether a parallel or concurrent control group is really necessary. Um, in some instances, if there is 
data available from a trial that was completed relatively recently in the same population under the same um, inclusion exclusion criteria using the same outcome, you might be able to use those controls as your control or maybe just part of your control. And there can be um, quite dramatic sample size savings if, if that's possible. Um, the futility design that I described a couple of slides ago was a concurrently controlled futility design. If you were to do that instead using historical controls, um, the sample size could be a third maybe of what I showed you. Um, can you answer multiple questions in the same design? Can you answer questions about dosing and timing in the same design? Um, or can you answer questions about two different endpoints in the same design? Um, maybe in some instances, a hypothesis test is really not the best way to achieve your goal. Um, I've seen some studies where an investigator has multiple interventions that they're trying to evaluate in a phase two space in order to decide what to move to phase three. Um, those interventions, if they work, might be very similar to each other. And so picking the best of them based on a hypothesis test could be very different, uh, very difficult. Um, it may be the case that selection theory allows you to do that in a statistically rigorous way. Um, and you can size the study that way instead of going about this through the typical hypothesis testing approach. Um, is the design adaptive? Um, I know it, uh, adaptive designs are sort of a, a buzz, buzzword right now. Um, and I am the first person to say that um, I think adaptive designs are great, but they're not always necessary. And they definitely make things more complicated. Um, but there are situations in which something like response adaptive randomization or um, dropping an arm, things like that might actually um, be very effective in terms of controlling the efficiency of your design. Another thing to keep in mind is that the sample size calculation depends on the method of analysis and the method of analysis depends on the design. So you, you sort of have to have all of this conversation together um, rather than in pieces. And just keep in mind that for some designs, simulation really may be the only way to determine the sample size. And there can be, depending on what design you're using and whether there are, are packages available for you to do the simulation already programmed, um, there may be lead time that's required. It, it will um, likely increase uh, the amount of time required to come up with the sample size determination from the typical closed form solution approach. Um, so I'm going to show you an example of an adaptive design that we worked on um, recently. I'm not going to show you the actual final design, but this is what um, we proposed to do in a planning grant that was ultimately funded for us to fully flesh out what the design would look like. So in this approach, uh, in this design, we took eligible subjects, we randomly assigned them to a placebo or one of four active doses, and we evaluated the primary outcome at 24 hours. And then after a burn-in period, um, we used response adaptive randomization to active, adaptively allocate patients to increase the number of patients and doses that were effective, reduce the number of patients assigned to doses that were not effective or above the target that we were looking for. And in this scenario, this was one of those places where we had to do, we had to come up with the sample size by simulation. And so I'm just showing you an example of um, what sort of goes into this on the back end. So you have to um, hypothesize what the truth might look like under various scenarios. So I'm only showing you two here, a null scenario where there's no change across dose and an alternative um, with, where the primary outcome increases and then sort of plateaus at the highest level. And then we go through that process of simulation lots of times under each scenario. So in this case, we actually had three or four alternatives that we were working with and the null, and we're tracking the behavior of those, um, of those trials under certain instances. So again, under the null, what you wanna see is that we're not very often declaring um, and it, one of the doses to be effective. 
And uh, the higher doses are relatively equally likely to be selected. The most commonly selected under the null is the lowest dose, which is what we would hope for. Um, under this alternative that we're showing here, you can see that the solid line, the, the probability that we declare an effective dose increases um, with increasing sample size, but you do get less bang for your buck um, at larger sample sizes. And you can see that um, the design doesn't uh, choose very well between the, the dose at the elbow and the maximum dose. Um, it chooses those relatively equally. Um, but the other two were chosen, the lower doses that are not effective are chosen much less often. But again, going through this process of specifying those alternatives, what is the outcome? How are you making those decisions? All of that takes time. Um, when you're justifying the sample size, it's important to be very upfront about how many subjects you need, whether or not it's adequate and how you came up with that number. Um, and I'm not gonna go into this too much because it looks like um, I'm running a little bit late on time, um, but I, I would encourage you to be honest. If you really need more, but you can't do it, explain why. And if you can answer the questions with fewer, but you're asking for more, explain why. There are two ways that we go about this. We can um, calculate the sample size based on specifying the difference, the variability and the target power. That's our preference. Um, in many cases, especially in early phase studies, we're limited by resources. And so what we're actually doing is specifying the sample size and the power and the variability and calculating the detectable difference. It's not ideal, but in either case, um, the sample size must be justified. There's freeware available on the web, um, the University of Iowa, Harvard, there's software available for purchase. Um, your statistical collaborators are gonna have lots of options available to them. The one that I use most frequently is actually not on here because it's, um, it's expensive, but it does have advan advanced functionality. Um, so we've talked about all of these things that we need to keep in mind. The last um, point that I'll make is that the logistics of actually implementing your trial can impact the sample size as well. So um, the first thing I would think about is the anticipated recruitment rate. How quickly are you gonna be able to do this? That may impact whether or not an adaptive design will work for you. It may impact um, how much follow-up time you have available in a time to event scenario. So we do need to be aware of that. Um, treatment crossovers and protocol non-adherence, um, those will both serve to dilute the effect estimate that you actually observe, um, dilute it meaning make it smaller than the truth. And so you will want to inflate the sample size in order to account for those in most scenarios. Loss to follow up and consent withdrawal, how are those gonna be handled? How much do you expect? Um, and whether or not there's any interim analysis because the alpha level that you have to specify will have to be adjusted for any interim analysis for overwhelming efficacy and the power will have to be adjusted for interim analysis for futility. <clears throat> All right, and I'm gonna stop here. This is a quote that I got a number of years ago. I'm not sure if it's still there. Um, from Russell Lenth, who is Professor Emeritus at the University of Iowa. And he said, I receive quite a few questions that start with something like this. I'm not much of a stats person, but I tried doing X, Y, Z. Am I doing it right? And his response was, please compare this with, I don't know much about heart surgery, but my wife is suffering from chest pains and I plan to operate. Can you advise me? Um, as I mentioned, there's lots of software out there just because you can plug numbers into it. And I'm paraphrasing the rest of his quote doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get out what you think you're getting out of it. Um, and those, um, you know, many of you have biostatistics departments at your institution. If you don't, I'm sure Will and the other faculty leaders can point you to some collaborators. Um, but we're, we're all here. Um, and, you know, this is, it, this is our job. This is what we like to do. And we, we love to collaborate with our clinical investigators. So find someone um, that you can work with, that you can grow with um, if you're at a junior stage. Uh, and it really can be a, a mutually beneficial arrangement for both of you. All right, any questions? Let me see, I got, there's 
another one. For the interim analysis, um, how does the power impact? How is the power impacted? Um, since the target population is not yet achieved in terms of N. Yes. So uh, the interim analysis, what we typically do is we test at a much smaller alpha level. Um, so if at the end of the study, the alpha level that you plan to test at is 0.05, we wouldn't do that at an interim. We would do it at something much smaller, um, 0.001. Um, there are different boundaries that one could choose from. Um, but at the time of the interim analysis, the power will be much less than you were expecting at the end of the study. But the only reason that you would conclude efficacy is if the samples, the, is if the effect size is much larger than you expected, right? So there's that trade-off. You have fewer patients. Um, you're observing a, a, a large effect size. So you won't have the power for the effect size that you targeted or potentially for the secondary endpoints, other things that you wanted to look at. Do you have any question in the chat? Um, for rare diseases with high variability in outcomes, what is the best way to maximize power and minimize N? I am going to punt on the answer to that question because there are folks who specialize in designs for rare diseases and I am not one of them. Um, I don't know if any of them are with us here today. No, I, but we will have some discussion at the course about um, rare diseases. And this is Lori talking. We will have some discussion at the in-person chances to discuss uh, rare diseases and uh, how to maximize power. So other questions? How does one develop a working relationship with a statistician who deals in specialized areas like rare diseases? Yes, that's a good question. So I'm going to answer it more generally. Generally, how does one develop a working relationship with a statistician who specializes in disease in specialized areas, period? Because there are lots of specialized areas. There are folks who specialize in dose binding. There are folks who specialize in rare diseases, folks who specialize in adaptive designs. Um, I think that um, you can, if you have a consulting group at your institution um, or a CTSA who provides biostat consulting services, that is a great place to start. If they don't have the expertise that you're looking for there within the CTSA, um, they may be able to point you to faculty within your department or within that the biostat department or public health sciences department at your institution. Um, if not, many of us know. Um, we know statistical collaborators across the country, right? And so we may be able to reach out. So I would encourage you to, to start reaching out to a statistician um, and get them to help you find someone who has the specific expertise that you're looking for. Or who is interested in developing the specific expertise that you're looking for is another, um, is another option. And Robin says we, the CTMC can help with that. Sharon, thank you so much for another great presentation. Of course, happy to help. And as always, I love your start and finish. Thank Thanks. If there are any final questions, please put them in the chat now. Otherwise, I think we can go ahead and end today's session.
I echo Dr. Gutman's thanks. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time, Dr. Yates. Of course, happy, happy to do it. All right, well, before everybody hops off, I'm going to put in the chat the link to the evaluation. This takes just a couple minutes. All right, thanks, Courtney. Do you thank need you for so anything? Much. Nope, you are all set. Thank you. All right, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.